We'll go down to uh, the middle of the page of line one. We're, we're going to begin the uh, trumpet judgments in just a moment. John uses an interesting pattern of writing here. There are three distinct sets of divine judgments that come on the world following the rapture. It's what we call the tribulation period, the last half of which is the great tribulation because it is so incredibly much worse than the first part. The first series of judgments are the seal judgments, S-E-L. Remember that we saw back in chapter 5, God held out his hand and there was a scroll in his hand, a book of judgment. It was sealed with seven seals. Jesus comes forward to take those seals off of the book of judgment so it can be read. And in chapter 6 of Revelation, one by one, Jesus begins to take off the seals. The first one he takes off is the revealing of Antichrist, and so it goes. Now in John's writings, he'll take the first six of each series, the first six seals, tell about the judgment, but the seventh seal introduces the next set of judgments, which are the trumpet judgments. He'll go through the first six trumpet judgments, but when he gets to the seventh trumpet judgment, it will usher in the third series of judgments, which are the vial, V-I-A-L, like a test tube or a beaker in a laboratory. So those are the three sets of judgments coming in this short seven-year period that follows the rapture, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the vial judgments. Now, I don't want to confuse you, but interspersed in these three sets of judgments are what we call parenthetical chapters, parentheses. They're little sidebars that God throws in, like the sealing of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses that we talked about last week. And we'll have more of those as we go along. Now to the middle of page one, when Jesus opens the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Oh, you blew it. <laughs> we read in a couple of places previously in Revelation, Revelation 4.10, that prior to this sixth seal, seventh seal, heaven was full of the anthems and praises and music of all the saints of all the ages, Old and New Testament, standing around the throne of God, singing with new voices, new songs of praise, new adoration to God accompanied by all the celestial orchestra, the great orchestra. On Easter Sunday, we're going to have Easter weekend, the Saturday night too, we're going to have such wonderful music here. Last year over Easter, we had the Lee County Symphony String Section. This year, we're going to have the uh, Charlotte County Symphony String Section. That doesn't mean people playing with strings here. We're talking about violins and violas and cellos. It's the most gorgeous music. And then our brass section, now you multiply that by a million fold or 10 million fold. And the voices of hundreds of millions of saints with no more throat problems, unlimited ranges, accompanied by at least 100 million angels. And the crescendo of sound that fills heaven in chapters four and five is incredible. Now, all of a sudden, in chapter 8, absolute silence. This is what we call the lull before the coming storm. You can read Revelation 4.10 on line 27, Revelation 5.11 on line 32, the sound that is in heaven. Now we go to page two, consider this incredible drama. I've just described it for you. There's not a sound for a half hour. Now something is going to happen and it is ominous and you can begin to follow along with me. In chapter eight, I have it for you in the King James. The NIV is there in front of you in the book racks or perhaps you have your own version with you. 
but follow now along with the narrator on the screen as we give you the entirety of this unbelievable eighth chapter of Revelation. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I noticed that the seven angels who stood before God were each given a trumpet. Another angel who had a gold container for incense, came and stood at the altar. This one was given a lot of incense to offer with the prayers of God's people on the gold altar in front of the throne. Then the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up to God from the hand of the angel. After this, the angel filled the incense container with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. Thunder roared, lightning flashed, and the earth shook. The seven angels now got ready to blow their trumpets. When the first angel blew his trumpet, hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. A third of the earth, a third of the trees, and a third of all green plants were burned. When the second angel blew his trumpet, something like a great fiery mountain was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships was destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet. A great star fell from heaven. It was burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on a third of the springs of water. The name of the star was Bitter, and a third of the water turned bitter. Many people died because the water was so bitter. When the fourth angel blew his trumpet, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck. They each lost a third of their light. So during a third of the day, there was no light, and a third of the night was also without light. Then I looked and saw a lone eagle flying across the sky. It was shouting, Trouble, trouble, trouble to everyone who lives on earth. The other three angels are now going to blow their trumpets. In the King James, uh, if you look at page 2, line 38, the King James says, wasn't an eagle, I heard an angel flying. I much prefer that translation. I heard an angel flying through the midst of the heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe! That's going to be trumpet number five. Woe, that will be trumpet number six. Woe, that will be trumpet number seven to the inhabitants of the earth. And uh, they are going to be the worst so far. Now, who is the angel of verse three? We don't know. Go to page three. We know he holds an incense censer. You've seen that in in many Roman Catholic churches, in many Greek Orthodox churches, uh, Russian Orthodox churches, you'll see the priest with the censer and the incense coming out of it. The angel holds this incense censer that contains the prayer of saints. Interesting little sidebar here. Some commentators, and I'm not giving this to you as doctrine, I'm just telling you these observations, have ventured that these prayers are the unanswered prayers to us unanswered, 
of the saints that have been stored until this time. Now these judgments that are coming up are so horrendous that the question has to be asked, are these judgments literal judgments or is the scripture just displaying hyperbole? It's going to sound as if it's science fiction. I'll tell you that right now. But I have something to show you in a few minutes that I think can disabuse you of the notion that it's uh, fiction. The first trumpet, line nine, with the blast from this horn comes the judgment of hail and fire mixed with blood. Remember, Christians are nowhere on the earth. Those people who've given the Lord their lives, who are committed to Jesus, they're gone. The rapture took place almost three years before this. So much has happened since then on earth, including the terrible Middle East conflagration that uh, it's, it's just stunning. And uh, many, many, many tens of millions of people have died. Before we're done with this study tonight, at least three and a half billion people will have perished on the earth. It's a horrendous thing. The first trumpet, judgment of hail and fire mixed with blood. The result is that a third of earth's trees and grass are consumed by fire. The ecological implications of this will keep you awake tonight. There will be a notable lessening of oxygen, for example. We Pentecostals like to quote Joel chapter 2, In the last day, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And Peter tells us that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. But there's another part to Joel's prophecy that comes true now. Joel 2, 30 and 31 that you see in the box. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Here again is proof to you that there are going to be people who give their lives to Christ in the tribulation period. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord. When? Right during this time. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said. And in the remnant, the rest of the people around the world, whom the Lord shall call. Now we come to uh, line 16, and this one staggers you. The second trumpet judgment, John saw what appeared to be a mountain burning with fire cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. This resulted in death of sea creatures, one third of them, one third of the ships at sea caught fire and sank, killing all the sailors aboard. The mountain that John sees here could very well have been a massive meteor. It's coming down through the sky. It probably looked like a mountain coming at him. Well, now there have been meteors that have struck the earth before, and this did not happen. But this apparently is a whole different ball game. I was uh, perusing the web the other day, and I was reading about meteors. And I came across a clip that our IT guys were able to download for me. I don't know how to do that. In the last three or four days, I have found the on and off switch to the computer. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not trying to come across to you as some computer nerd. I don't know anything about computers, but our IT guys here do. They're good at it. And I had them download it. And I'm going to show you a little clip here. I think it's six or seven minutes long. This was put together by the Japanese, people over in that country. This has nothing to do with the gospel. These people have nothing to do with the faith of our fathers. This is a probable cause and effect of a massive meteor hitting the earth. I watched it three or four times. My eyes must have looked like golf balls. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And again, I want you to know this was not put together by the Assemblies of God. It was not put together by the National Association of Evangelicals. This is put together by a study team over in Japan. What would happen to this planet if it were hit by a massive meteor? And we're talking about a meteor here, say, the size of a city. 
which is a very distinct possibility, you know. What would happen to this earth? Are these verses that we read in Revelation just somebody's fertile imagination? Or did John really see something so cataclysmic that it will shake you? Watch the screens.隕石の大きさや衝突点との位置関係を分かりやすくするため現在の地球で衝突があったと仮定しました隕石の大きさは本州の幅を超えます地球の表面を構成する厚さ10キロの地殻が丸ごとめくり上げられていきます。地下窟なのです。地下窟並みに張り付いた水深4000メートルの海がまるで薄皮のように見えます。幅が1キロ近くあるような巨大な破片が巻
衝突から1日でついに地球は灼熱の岩石蒸気に覆い尽くされるのです。岩石蒸気は地球全体を1年近くにわたって覆い続けます間近に無数の太陽が出現したのと同じです生命のふるさと海も変動に巻き込まれていきます岩石蒸気に覆われて間もなくのことでした海が激しく泡立ちます海が沸騰を始めたのです岩石蒸気からの膨大な熱が海水を蒸発させます激しい蒸発は1分間に5センチという猛烈なスピードで海面を下げていきます。むき出しになった海底は容赦なく熱にさらされ溶岩のように溶け出します衝突からおよそ1ヶ月後岩石蒸気を透かしてみた地表です平均水深4000メートルの海が跡形もなく消えていますの中では地球最初の生命が微生物として誕生したばかりの頃でした微生物たちは大きな打撃を受けたに違いありません平和に見える地球は過去に隕石衝突の災難をたびたび経験してきましたそして私たち地球上に生きる生物はそのたび重なる打撃をかいくぐって生き延びてきたのです4.6 billion years or not. I always tell you to ask Dave Thomas, he give you a report on that. But <clears throat> a couple of little caveats on that. A uh, kilometer is about two thirds of a mile, a meter is 39 inches. So uh, if you remember some of those stats in there put together by these uh, scientists over in Japan, it's a pretty scary thing when you have a 10, 12,000 foot deep ocean. Evaporate in seconds. Now that's built on the basis of this massive meteor. And John doesn't see a meteor anywhere near that size, but this one takes out one third of the oceans. Skeptics, skeptics would like to uh, cluck their tongues at this and say, you know, that's just science fiction, it can't happen. But history is going to refute you. On that. We remember just a few years ago the horrendous tsunami that hit Indonesia, those regions over there, even hitting the Philippines and up into it, even hit into India. Take a look at a globe when you get home and see the vastness of that tsunami that wiped out villages and towns and cities, took thousands of lives with an earthquake. When we do our tours to, uh, to Greece after we go to Israel, we get on a little ship and we visit some of the Greek islands, which are stunningly beautiful. One of those islands is Santorini. It's called the most photographed island in the world. It's probably the most beautiful island in the world. And as your ship comes into the harbor, straight ahead of you is a cliff that must be at least 10 stories high, maybe higher than that, that's just virtually straight up and down. 
And you wonder how such a formation could have happened until you go into history and you read that in 1450, roughly, B.C., before Christ, Santorini was a massive volcano explosion. The water, this beautiful blue water we're sailing into the harbor, was once earth. Now it's four to 5,000 feet deep, and it's ocean. When the volcano erupted in 1450 B.C., it dislodged 33 cubic miles of dirt. Put that one together. 33 cubic miles of dirt. Blew it into the sky with such force that it triggered a tsunami, a massive tidal wave that went north to Crete, which is 100 miles away. It got there in about a half an hour and wiped out Crete. It covered Crete for a short time. That's where the Minoan civilization, King Minos, whom we know in mythology as King Midas, but in reality it was King Minos. And the Cretans were able, some of them, to escape by ships. And in their fear, they kept going east until they landed on the western coast of what we know today as Israel. And they settled there 1,450 years before Christ. We know those people as the Philistines. Goliath had his background as a Cretan. He wasn't in Crete. He was born afterwards. But his family, 400 years earlier, had come from Crete. They were skilled in ironwork. That's why they had more superior weapons than the Israelis had. Now, not only did that tsunami wipe out Crete 100 miles to the north, but winds were blowing south, and 33 cubic miles of dirt blew into the sky, and a south wind blew them over Egypt. At the same time as the 10 plagues, now, do you really want to sit there and tell me this is science fiction? Read your history books. God's mercy is very long, and his patience is extended. But in Genesis 6, 3 is a staggering verse in which God says, My spirit will not always strive with man. So in this second trumpet judgment, line 16 of page 3, John sees this mountain, this meteor burning with fire. In the little video we just saw, the Japanese scholar said that it hit the earth, their meteor hit the earth at 40,000 miles an hour, 70,000 kilometers an hour. It would be 40,000 miles an hour, wouldn't it? Coming down through the atmosphere, can you imagine how hot that would be that can dissolve rockets unless they are properly covered with all kinds of whatever it is that they put on the outside of these spaceships? It would burn them to a crisp. But here comes this massive mountain. Only God knows how much of it's already been burned and stripped away. But it's got to be unbelievably hot, impacting the ocean at 40,000 miles an hour. A third part of the sea becomes blood. What do you think that means, Pastor? Well, I think it means a third part of the sea becomes blood. <laughs> in, uh, in John's day, the sea he would refer to normally would be considered the Mediterranean Sea, although it could be much wider than that. He talks about one-third of the ships at sea catching fire. For decades, our U.S. Sixth Fleet has been stationed in the Mediterranean Sea. The Russian fleets come down through the Aegean Sea, through the Dardanelles. So you can imagine the massive chaos that's going to take place here when this second trumpet sounds. No wonder the angel flew through the sky saying, Trouble! Whoa! Trouble! 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 Three sets of these judgments are going to hit. The third trumpet, John now sees a star, this is line 27, a torch as it were. 
falling from the sky that strikes the earth and pollutes the water supply of three major rivers. The falling star is called Wormwood. Clean, fresh water is becoming more and more of a problem through humanity. One of the things missionaries are doing, especially effectively in Africa, is digging wells to help the Africans who have no source of fresh water to get water. The fourth trumpet, line 35, notice verse 12 out of Revelation 8. The fourth trumpet sounded and a third part of the sun was smitten, a third part of the moon, a third part of the stars. So the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third of it. And the night likewise. Instead of the somewhat normal eight hours of darkness and 16 hours of light, that system will be reversed. Most of the world will be in darkness much of the time. Before uh, coming here to be your pastor, I used to spend every uh, summer, part of the summer, in Alaska. And uh, I know this is going to sound terribly carnal to you, but uh, I always felt the call of God to go up there when the salmon season started. <laughs> I've caught a couple of tarpon in my life, and that's great fun, but so is a salmon, a, a king salmon, not just the silvers, but the king salmon, the big ones. They get up, they get up to 80, 90 pounds of salmon. And you hook onto a big old male salmon, and uh, you think you've just been hit in the face by a train. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And many times saw the aurora borealis up there, those strange exotic lights that light up the northern sky. It's gorgeous. God is a master artist. But uh, in the summertime, it stays light up there most of the time. I have played golf teed off at midnight, and it's just as light as you can ever want it. About 2, 30, 3 o'clock, it gets a little dusky, and Four or five o'clock, it's sunlight again, which is wonderful. I don't like the night. Men are lovers of darkness, but not us Germans. And, uh, but then in the wintertime, it's just the reverse. It can be around 10 o'clock in the morning when the sun comes up. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it's dark again. And there are huge sociological problems in Alaska of drunkenness and suicide that many attribute to the darkness, to the darkness. Now, if you've had cataclysms that knock out much of your energy in electrical systems and so forth, and now you start to have a lessening of the sun, um, you got problems. Just to kind of lighten this up a little bit, uh, we have some friends, Darlene and I, and, and the, the lady, I'm going to tell you who it is, but the lady just says strange things. <laughs> We're fishing one night for crappie and bass out on Lake Dardanelle, which is down at Russellville, Arkansas. And we're, we're fishing off this boulder along the shore, and it's about midnight. And it's a little chilly, and she's given to chilliness anyway. She's cold. I told her, if you aren't saved and you miss heaven and go to hell, it'd be no big deal to you. <clears throat> You'll say to the devil, that about it? And uh, so she was griping about the cold, and uh, all of a sudden the clouds, we had cloud cover, all of a sudden the clouds rifted. And the big full moon was apparent. And she says to us, oh, good, there's the moon. It will be so much warmer now. <laughs> I'm going to write a book when I no longer need credentials or friends. So darkness comes. 
Now at the top of the page four, you see the warning angel. In the 13th verse of this chapter, we encounter a warning angel flying through the skies, crying, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the three trumpet judgments yet to come. He's saying that as bad as the first four trumpets have been, the next three will be progressively more damaging and hurtful. The three woes are trumpets five, six, and seven. You can follow along in the scripture narrative on your page, on your Bible, or you can watch the screen. Travis, if you will, please. When the fifth angel blew his trumpet, I saw a star fall from the sky to earth. It was given the key to the tunnel that leads down to the deep pit. As it opened the tunnel, smoke poured out like the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air turned dark because of the smoke. Locusts came out of the smoke and covered the earth. They were given the same power that scorpions had. The locusts were told not to harm the grass on the earth, or any plant, or any tree. They were to punish only those people who did not have God's mark on their foreheads. The locusts were allowed to make them suffer for five months, but not to kill them. The suffering they caused was like the sting of a scorpion. In those days, people will want to die, but they will not be able to. They will hope for death, but it will escape from them. These locusts looked like horses ready for battle. On their heads, they wore something like gold crowns, and they had human faces. Their hair was like a woman's long hair, and their teeth were like those of a lion. On their chests, they wore armor made of iron. Their wings roared like an army of horse-drawn chariots rushing into battle. Their tails were like a scorpion's tail with a stinger that had the power to hurt someone for five months. Their king was the angel in charge of the deep pit. In Hebrew, his name was Abaddon, and in Greek, he was Apollyon. The first horrible thing has now happened. But wait, two more horrible things will happen soon. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet. I heard a voice speak from the four corners of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. The voice spoke to this angel and said, Release the four angels who are tied up beside the great Euphrates River. The four angels had been prepared for this very hour and day and month and year. Now they were set free to kill a third of all people. By listening, I could tell there were more than 200 million of these war horses. In my vision, their riders wore fiery red, dark blue, and yellow armor on their chests. The heads of the horses looked like lions with fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. One third of all people were killed by the three terrible troubles caused by the fire, the smoke, and the sulfur. The horses had powerful mouths, and their tails were like poisonous snakes that bite and hurt. The people who lived through these terrible troubles did not turn away from the idols they had made. And they did not stop worshiping demons they kept on worshiping idols that were made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Not one of these idols could see, hear, or walk. 
no one stopped murdering or practicing witchcraft or being immoral or stealing. That last line uh, almost makes your heart jump up in your chest. Through all this, the great multitudes of people will not repent. You see, someone who says, if I don't get saved now under the gentle conviction of the Holy Spirit, I'll get saved later. No, you won't. Not a chance in the world. I've mentioned several times in studies that when people talk about the tribulation, there, there are people who think they're going through half of it and people who are going through all of it. We don't believe Christians will go through any of it, but that the rapture precedes it. So these other folks will say, and they're good people. This has nothing to do with fellowship or their faith in the Lord, but their interpretation is that the tribulation will be seven years of 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 uh, difficulty on this earth such has been experienced before and then they cite the various holocausts especially the Jewish holocaust they will cite the Spanish Inquisition they will go through the Crusades and the hell that accompanied the Crusades will go clear back to the Babylonians and the Persians and with good historic merit except that what they are saying and talking about in their definition of tribulation is man's anger, man's inhumanity to man. My dear friend, tell me one thing you just saw on the screen that has anything to do with man's inhumanity to man. This is a divine wrath of God on this earth, because this earth is under a curse. It has been since the Garden of Eden. God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. I don't want to be here through half of that or all of it. Those who love Jesus are a part of the bride of Christ. What lover would want his bride to go through that? This is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It has nothing to do with Christianity at all. It has nothing to do with people who place their faith in the blood of the Lamb. It has to do with man's rejection of God and his salvation plan. And an earth that has embraced sin and welcomed it into its bosom. Now go to page uh, 5, line 13. Where is this bottomless pit? We read, we read that uh, verse 2, the fifth angel opened the bottomless pit. There arose smoke out of the pit. Where is the pit? Is this hell? I don't think so. It's my own personal belief that this is that great gulf fixed between hell and paradise in Hades. I give you a written explanation of it. But let me talk to you about it. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus told the story. You say, well, that was a parable. I don't think so, because Jesus said there was a certain man. He pinpoints him and names him, as opposed to just being a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. There was a man named Lazarus who was poor. He died, and he went into paradise. There was a man who was very rich, and not because he was rich, but because he rejected God, he died and he went to hell. Now remember that before Calvary, and we've gone through this, but let me go through it again. Before Jesus died on the cross, when a person died in, in Hebrew scripture days, in Old Testament days, his body was dead, but his soul just kept living, just as it does now. One second after this, body of mine dies, I'll be more alive than I've ever, ever been. My soul and spirit will be in eternity somewhere. If you know the Lord, Paul writes, absent from the body, present with the Lord, just like that. Now back in the Old Testament days, you didn't go to be with the Lord, you went to a place called Hades, H-A-D-E-S, that had two compartments, massive, we say compartments, don't think of a closet here. We're talking about vast areas. One was hell and one was paradise, two sections of Hades. They were separated by a 
huge chasm or abyss that was bottomless. The rich man came to his senses in hell and apparently somehow he was able to visualize Lazarus, says in the bosom of Abraham, standing next to the great patriarch Abraham in the paradise section of Hades. And he wanted help and Abraham said, we can't. We can't come to you from here and you can't come to here from there because between us is this great gulf fixed, this bottomless abyss that has been fixed. I think that's the bottomless pit being referred to here. Now when Jesus died on the cross, you say, well that's kind of scary when I die, I don't want to even go to that paradise place. Me either. Although it's probably very nice. But it's empty. It's an absolutely empty place because when Jesus died on the cross, he said to the thief, just before he died, he said to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. Not, not, not in heaven, paradise. What was he doing in paradise? He went down into Hades, went into that part of Hades called paradise and emptied it out and took everyone in there to be with him in eternity. That's what happens to us. Now this huge gulf, I think, and this is not Assemblies of God doctrine. It's right, but I <laughs> always say that. And forgive me, Lord. But as all, I just tell you very frankly, it's my own belief that this is the great gulf that is fixed. Line 21, these locusts, don't think of bugs here. These are evil creatures housed for eons in this bottomless pit. I believe they are a vast horde of one-third. We know that there were at least one-third of the angels that went along with Lucifer in his abortive rebellion against God that got them all thrown out of heaven. We know there are at least a hundred million remaining good angels, at least that many. So if that's the figure, then there were another 50 million that went into this rebellion against God. What's happened to them? Some of them are on this earth. Ben told you a few minutes ago about demonstrations of demon possession that he's witnessed. I saw it so stark just a few weeks ago in India. But hey, you can see it in Fort Myers. Demon possession, not among Christians. Not among Christians. Somebody came here one day, asked to see me, so I came out of my office and they were walking around. I said, can I help you? And this fellow said, yes, we'd like to see the room where you deliver demons out of Christians. I said, what? What room do you take people? There's some churches that do have that. What room do you take Christians to deliver them from demons? I said, well, any demons that need to be delivered can be done at the altar or out in the parking lot because the Holy Spirit doesn't say you've got to be in such and such a room. But on the other hand, Christians are not demon-possessed. That is an absolute impossibility. Jesus says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Look at a couple of background verses here. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. We learn about the fall of Satan, Lucifer, Satan, same entity. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? But thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I, 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 I will be like the Most High. It took God maybe a billionth of a second to throw him out of heaven. This is why while you have a healthy understanding of the damage Satan can wreak on this earth and in a person's life, the Christian has no fear of him because greater is he who is in you. I mean, it's not even close. And then in Ezekiel 28, you have this lamentation on the king of Tyrus. Here you have a prophecy, and you might want to jot this down. Hermeneutics is the study, how do you study the Bible? Hermeneutics. 
It was introduced to the world by Mr. Nudix. His first name was Herman. So that's why it's called Herman Nudix. It's, it's the, how you interpret the Bible. Now in prophetic scripture, there is a law of double reference. And here's a classic case of it. Ezekiel is prophesying against a king up in Tyre, which was up in uh, Lebanon, just 100 or so miles to the north of him, who at that time was threatening Israel. But by law of much more important double reference, this refers to Satan. And you read about this definition of Satan. You were in Eden. Look at verse th uh, 35. Well, Tyrus was never in Eden. He was a man. But Satan, you've been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Listen to how he was adorned before the fall. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. You've walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect until iniquity was found in you. That's where he commanded the rebellion against God. And God threw Lucifer and those 50 million at least other angels out of the sky like shooting stars and sent them to the earth. Now, oh man. Let me take just a minute. Our narrator on the, on the uh, video with the, uh, with the uh, meteor that fell into the sea said in the 4.6 billion years of the earth. Pastor, do you think the earth was a 4.6 billion? I don't know, it wasn't here. We, we can trace human history very accurately back 10,000 years. It's my own personal belief, and I preached this at General Council one year and didn't get thrown out of the assembly, so maybe it's not so harebrained after all. It's my own personal belief that between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 2, a disaster happened. In Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Simple. I believe that passionately. Verse 2. And the heavens became void. The earth became, the earth became void. And darkness fell upon it. Well, that isn't what God created in verse 1. Something awful happened between those first two verses of the Bible, in my opinion. This is not doctrine. This is my opinion. And I believe that cataclysm that occurred was what we read about here in Ezekiel that I just read to you here. Thou was perfect in all thy ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in thee. Peter tells us that God cast Satan and all the sinning angels out of heaven, where'd they come? Apparently into this region of the cosmos and particularly onto planet Earth. And something horrible happened here. Darkness was found on the face of the deep. But the Spirit of God, boy, I love that passage. The Spirit of God brooded rested on the face of the deep. That's the same Holy Spirit that baptized me in 1950. Because it's the, the Holy Spirit hasn't changed. He's God. There's no shadow of turning with God, James tells us. The same Holy Spirit that breathed life and spoke light back into that disintegrated creation is the same Holy Spirit that speaks light and resurrection. It's the same Holy Spirit that went into that little tomb on the north end of Jerusalem on a Sunday morning. Bam! Jesus was alive. Came out of those grave clothes. And Ephesians 2, 1 says, You hath he quickened too, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Oh, I wish I had a couple more hours. In the box, Christians need not fear these unclean spirits. You can read that. That's from Tim LaHaye, and I believe it. Well, I gotta quit. I'll just pick this up. 
Remember, this is going to be uh, an eight, 12, eight to 12 week study. You know, I go over and over and over and over this for days before I come to you. But every time I open up God's incredible word, I've got to tell you, I get goosebumps. It just gives me goosebumps. And I've been doing this for over a half century. This book is so alive and so relevant and up to date takes your breath away. Everything about science, everything about history, everything about physics, everything about the disciplines of life speak into this book. And everything about this book speaks into those disciplines. It's incredible. And Paul knew it a whole lot better than I did, but Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. My faith is not in some slipshod little God that came out of some camp meeting somewhere. My faith is in the God who is and who was and who always will be. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just stand.